you. Thank you for having me. This is a wonderful event and obviously very important subject matter. So uh, we're going to cover a lot of stuff today and uh, I'm excited at the opportunity. I've uh, been involved in a lot of different things over the years. Uh, I worked on a boat that would collect killer whale poop samples because they were endangered and it was a way to non-invasively see how healthy they were. Obviously it didn't smell that bad because the captain's eating a sandwich. Um, I did a postdoc in a material science lab which gave me a very different perspective on all of this. So as you heard, I did my master's and PhD focusing on plastic pollution. These people love plastic because they say that, that plastic was created for a purpose and it served its purpose and that plastics failed people. People failed plastics more than plastics failed people. Interesting. Very interesting. So I, I got to see a really diverse group uh, of people and understandings about the issue. Um, I don't look or act like the conventional scientist, so people kind of drop things to me. Like I was told I could go to the state capitol in Arizona to talk to legislators about the ocean, but to take it seriously. So I dressed up as a shark. <laughs> and then I was involved in a lot of media things. Uh, there was a pro, kind of a short film about my research that won an Emmy, which was pretty cool. And uh, people think science is kind of nerdy and dorky, especially if I'm giving talks to kids. I like to show this picture because that's Aquaman. <laughs> and I got to meet him, and he is, he is very muscular. <laughs> Although he says he doesn't work out, so those, those pecs are not non-workout pecs. Um, so I, I work at the Shaw Institute, um, and we focus on a lot of different things. We do a lot of environmental sampling, especially in the summertime as people are swimming. Uh, we, we usually have a lecture series that's kind of transitioning as we're growing, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, but yeah, I do a lot of stuff. I like to dress as a shark and read books to kids about the ocean. Uh, I'll, we also go to assisted living facilities, and I would take bones of, sh of whales that I had eaten as a shark. And then we have some really neat analytical <laughs> capabilities at the Institute, which I find to be really accessible for teaching people about science. So this little girl is working on a very technical engineering instrument to understand plastic better. It's a really hands-on approach that I, I'm a big fan of. So we do a lot of things at, at the Shaw Institute. And, and again, when I, when I like to talk about where my inspiration comes from, I like to, to show kind of my first lab, uh, and that's Tucker. <laughs> Tucker was used in the aforementioned picture. There's a big dorsal fin behind him. He's no longer with us, but we still keep his memory and his, uh, his group with us. He's part of a group called Conservation Canines that are used all over the world, which is really special. Um, what we noticed is in this beautiful area off the coast of Washington, there were, there were you know, this very specific group of killer whales that would only eat Chinook salmon. And this is a really hot spot for ecotourism, so we started to kind of think, could there be some interactions here that aren't so great? I like to show this short video because it's probably my, f my favorite killer whale behavior. It's called a spy hop. They're literally just like poking their head out to look around, like when you look through the blinds at the neighbors. <laughs> you'll see a, a big male dorsal fin and then a little spy hop right here. There it is. Just looking, wondering what the heck you're doing. But eventually what we would find are things that didn't feel like fish, didn't feel like bone. It felt strangely familiar and it ended up being plastic in nature. And, and for, for us at the time, it was really concerning because these animals, I don't think anyone has an idea how big they are. It, this room probably stretches the size of a killer whale. They're huge, 30 feet, twice the size of a great white. So, so something so big winding up, or something so small ending up in something so big was really concerning for us. So we started to kind of get into this, the realm of plastic pollution. I think with the larger plastics we call macroplastics, it's pretty well known what those can do. Sea turtles will take them in, they'll take water in, and then if they take in something like a straw, they have the water come out their nose, it can get stuck. Large bags can make whales feel full or can make them feel, or can, there can be a blockage somewhere in the GI tract. But these really small plastics were concerning for us. How did they get there? Where did they come from? Uh, I really like this image because this is from a study that used fluorescent plastic particles. And you can see, you probably heard of DDT and things that can kind of concentrate. If I were to look at a subsection of this picture, I'd maybe get six particles. There's probably 40 or 50 inside this one shrimp. So if you're a predator eating a lot of shrimp, it's just going to concentrate higher and higher up the food chain. So this is something that we really wanted to study in a lot more detail, but I had to start at the beginning and figure out how did this process even sort of begin with. We covered a lot of great stuff already, so I don't have to talk a lot about a lot of this. Um, but this is kind of what it looks like in terms of how much plastic we use 
as a, as a really a, a species. We, we generate quite a bit of it. A lot of it's used, a lot of it's discarded, and, and then you know, the, the, the R word that we don't like to talk about too much, um, recycling. And, and when I first started working on this, it was in Arizona, so talking about plastic water bottles was a lot more relevant. It's hot there. But over the course of a day, if you put three or if you put four, put four bottles in the recycle, of those four, maybe three go to a landfill, and then one will get recycled. But we call that downcycling because you're turning into something of lesser value. Now, a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why this is so complicated. And, and it, it kind of goes back to this, sim, this symbol, which was sort of made as an afterthought. Um, when I worked in, as, a, as a postdoc, I recycled. I did it in many different ways with many different plastics. You have to kind of imagine that you're working at a recycling plant. And, and the material, you know it can be recycled. You have to sort it. You have to group it. Here's a typical bottle. That, that's really nice, right? They're not just saying recycle. They're saying, please, right? <laughs> please recycle. So I get this as someone who works here, and I know that there's a label on it. If I mix the label in with the other, with the other bottle that, that's underneath, it's going to be this kind of muddy mess. You can think about recycling like paints. If you mix a bunch of paints together, it's going to make an interesting color. All right, so I've got to get the label off. So that's one step. Now there's probably an adhesive under there. An adhesive is a different type of polymer. So I've got to get the adhesive off. Now I have both those off. Now I have that stupid little ring underneath the top, right? That's a different color. And it's a different plastic. I got to get that off, as well as the lid, and sort all of that. So if I'm working at a recycling plant, there's no way I would take the time to do that. So a lot of this, a lot of this problem that we're in right now, we're kind of setting ourselves up to fail. There's labels on everything. That really makes it a hindrance for us to be able to properly sort or properly recycle it. What I ended up doing was I went to Mayo Clinic in Arizona, huge hospital chain. And at the time, the lab I was working was developing COVID tests that were in your nose. So you'd go and do a little swab, and they detect COVID that way. You use a lot of plastic. But we kind of understood why. You don't, you don't want to propagate disease while you're, while you're doing this stuff. But I said to the hospital, are there aspects of your plastic that you use that don't touch any spit or anything nasty? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll set them aside for you. So I got a hold of them. And working with these material scientists who were brilliant, I could, start to, I could start to create like a recycling strategy for this hospital. What I would do is receive the top of these pipette containers. And I would grind it up. And I would extrude it as filament. And then what I would go to the hospital, I would say, is there something that you buy a lot of? Or is there something, are there kids in here anymore? Is there something in here that pisses you off? And they would say, Yes, we have these cuvettes that we need to use, but the cuvettes are tall. And if I fill the cuvette up, the weight of it will make the rack fall over. So then I said, sweet. And I worked with a designer who designed a taller rack, and I 3D printed it using that filament from their own garbage. We ran similar experiments. Now, now this 3D printing, you probably heard, it's really accessible. It's taken off. It's very cheap. Uh, it's a really cool concept. Some plastics can't be recycled more than once. Some, some can. I ran a couple different experiments. One was to, was to recycle a, a polyethylene up to 10 times. What that means is I'm basically liquefying it. I'm melting it, and I'm melt pressing it, putting 10,000 pounds of pressure on it. And I could do that eight times before it started to show degradation. So there are some things that, that can be done. We just, again, we set ourselves up for failure. Now, one of the responses I got was, OK, well, if I have a 3D printer, how, how do I know your stuff is as good as the stuff I could buy on Amazon? So I did an experiment. This is called a tensile test. You basically have this instrument that pulls on, on a melted piece of your plastic until it breaks. And you can track that. You don't necessarily have to understand uh, the complexities of the data. But this was brand new filament from Amazon. And that's my recycled filament. You want to see if the bars can match, the bars match. So it can be done. We just set ourselves up, again, to fail. Make everything the same color. Make a label that's printed on or that pulls off easily. Now, I'll say this. My, my brain gets a little crazy these days because I was asked to do a TED talk at MIT. And now it's like, oh, is this a thing I should talk about? Is this a thing I should talk about? <laughs> but we have to think about, like, I even have to take a step back. Why is the adhesive on the bottle? And the other side of my brain has to say, well, Charlie, if this is just a Gatorade bottle, who cares? I mean, you can see red, red, orange, orange. But if, if you're ordering chemicals for the lab, Charlie, and the labels come off, it's not great. It needs to stay on because then you're not going to know what it is. And if you use the wrong chemicals, it's something, something disastrous can happen. 
So, so it's a very complex thing that I'll, I'll shed a little bit light, a little bit more light on it. But this was eye-opening for me because I, I, a biologist, got to work with chemists and engineers to to learn about how recycling can be done. And a lot of the times, these things are meant to last. So let's make them last. I don't. This isn't going to end up in the environment. It's going to stay on my face. And when I get it replaced with a plastic lens, then hopefully I can work with that group to figure out how to re how to properly recycle these somehow. But if it's meant to last a long time. We should try to make it last a long time, as much as possible. Um, so that said, we have a lot of stuff that we produce. I was just saying to Danny that, my wife's here, that um, we talk about, people would say like COVID is spreading in this community. And it's like, COVID isn't. People are. It's like a lot of this stuff is ending because we're buying it. We buy a lot of stuff. We buy the, people say packaging is one of the worst things you can have. Well, we, we buy the thing that the plastic is the packaging of. So yeah, it's, you're right. We are a culture that kind of does that. But what happens is so much of it ends up in landfills and some of it, oh, so much of it ends up as pollutant, pollution that it ends up being subjected to things like to the sunlight, which can cause it to break down, or the, the salinity of the ocean that turns these bigger plastics into much smaller ones. This particular picture is concerning for me, not just because of the colors that shouldn't be in there, but these little round bits, these guys here, those are called the nurdles. That's a pre-production plastic. That means before this is made into the form that it's in, you get those pellets and you, you melt them into a mold and it cools and makes this. So this can only come from really specific places. Either there was a spill at the ocean or there's a company that's transporting them and it's ending up in the sewer. This absolutely should not be, I mean, none of that should be in there, but that should not be in there. It's really scary to see. So in the micro world, we know that, that these plastics are degrading over time and ending up in the ocean. We also talked about clothing being made out of plastic and those fibers shedding. We have those nurdles that I just showed you a picture of. And then, you know, back before President Obama put in the, the ban on, on exfoliants and microbeads, they, this used to be more of a thing. You can still buy these products that have that in it. But th these were some of the most leading, scary sources of microplastics and now nanoplastics in the ocean. We call the ones that start off small, primary microplastics, like the nurdles and the microbeads. And then the ones that break down over time, we call secondary microplastics. But if you think about that picture of the shrimp, they both can enter the ecosystem at a really low level and, and work their way up, concentrating as they go. This is scary for kind of three reasons. The physical particle itself can cause an issue being in that animal, just the physical particle itself. You also have the internal chemistry. So we talked earlier about plastics like PVC. You've heard of PVC piping. VC stands for vinyl chloride. It's carcinogenic. It's not great. Um, and then you have the ability for plastic. And in many cases, it's either hydrophobic or hydrophilic. It likes water, doesn't like water. There's a lot of other things in the ecosystems that have those same properties, and they're attracted to each other. So in this way, plastics, microplastics specifically, can attract bacteria, phytoplankton, persistent organic pollutants, and even pathogens. And when they, when they break, it creates a really high surface area. So the more of the surface area there is, the more it can concentrate. And some studies have found it up to a million times stronger than what's found in the, in the surrounding environment, those chemicals. So it's, it's pretty, this was very concerning for me as a researcher. And, and I, I ended up having a lot more questions than I did answers because I just, yes, we're finding it, but what's it doing? And how's it affecting species health? I'm sure you see these, these headlines. Probably eat a credit card's worth of plastic every week. Every piece of plastic ever made still exists. Plastic bottles harm human health at every stage of their life cycle. These are all wrong. So, so my, my spot is always going to be objective. I'm going to hold everyone accountable the same way. So if something is said, so here's an example, right? Every single piece of plastic ever made still exists. Plastic goes into landfill. Some of the landfill stuff is incinerated. Some plastics go into the wastewater treatment plant. The sludge is incinerated. That's just, that's just impossible. So trying to make sure, like this is ammunition for the fossil fuel industry because they can just pick this apart and say, wrong. no, you guys are wrong. You're, so I'm trying to make sure all of the stuff that we're putting out there is, is, is accurate as it can be. That, that also includes pictures like this. I'm sure you've seen something similar. I don't like to see this as a researcher. This is really pretty horrifying, especially someone that would like to eat seafood. But, but the thing that comes to mind for me is something called <coughs> a power calculation. Excuse me. A power calculation. So let's see. Do you live in Belfast? Mm -hmm. Do you like pineapple on pizza? No. 
Okay, so is it fair for me to say the town of Belfast does not like pineapple and pizza? No. no. Right, because I only asked one person. But if I were to, what's the population of Belfast? 7,000. 7,000. If I maybe surveyed half of that and the answer was no, then you could say, yeah, with confidence, most of Belfast probably doesn't like pineapple on pizza. The same thing can be applied to this. How many fish of this species are in a school? A lot. So things like this are good, but we have to be careful that not, we're not being just as bad as the other industry by perpetuating things that, that aren't false, but aren't as true as they can be. And it's this term that you mentioned earlier, which I really like, which is greenwashing. For me, that the second kind of definition holds more true for this, but science is really not black and white. It's very gray. It has a lot of gray area, so it's very difficult with some of these concepts. We have to make sure that we're just walking that fine line. I don't want to be as bad as the group that, I, that attacks me on a regular basis by perpetuating things that might not be as true. Um, now, I hold, that, I hold everyone accountable to that same standard. One of the new things that I'm sure you've heard about are right here. Dish and laundry detergent pods and sheets. Now, this packaging is really nice. Clean, free and clear, leaf, beautiful. <laughs> Less plastic packaging. I like it. They list their, sorry, they list their, their list of things. 100% plastic, plastic free, eco-friendly, vegan, biodegradable. And then they have all simple, worry-free ingredients. You don't even need to worry about it because they say, worry-free. Good. <laughs> Same thing down here. They put in very small text. Uh, Fragrance-free, bio-based, biodegradable, and then same thing. Now, both of these types, pods and sheets, uh, are, they have the, a coating that's called polyvinyl alcohol. Polyvinyl alcohol is plastic. It's water-soluble plastic. So just as you put salt in water and it disappears, but you can still taste it, same thing with this. Now, why is this allowed to happen? This dissolves right away and becomes a microplastic, almost a nanoplastic immediately. We have to look to this label. This says EPA Safer Choice Certified. So we have to dig a little bit deeper. This is the story of a researcher. There's a ranking for different chemicals based on how harmful they may be. The green circle means that the chemical has been verified to be of low concern based on experimental and model data. And sure enough, if you look at polyvinyl alcohol, it's got that nice green dot. Uh, so as researchers, we do what researchers do. And what we did is we looked at a bunch of other studies that focus on polyvinyl alcohol. And started with the killer whales, went into my, my grad school life. I've always been surrounded by poop and, and wastewater, so great. We know that when, your house, when water leaves your house, it goes to a water treatment facility. There's a lot of different ones, maybe not in Maine, if you're not on the same system, but in, in the city I was in at the time, in, in Phoenix, that's usually what happens. The good thing is a bunch of studies had been done on how this material behaves in a wastewater treatment plant. Sweet, saves us time. So we could look at how this really complicated process exists within a, within a wastewater treatment plant, but we could specifically look at the areas that are designed to break down the, the solids that leave your house. A lot of microorganisms that really focus in on that. And again, these studies had already been published, so good, less work. But what we can do is we could look at how much of this material is used for laundry, for laundry pods specifically. We could look at, after all of this is done, how much degrades. And then we could project how much goes untreated into ecosystems beyond. We found that of the 17,000 metric tons that's used, 10,000, I'll, I'll actually, I won't break it down with all the numbers. I'll just show you the percentages. It's much easier. But we know that when it leaves a wastewater treatment plant, it leaves in the, the liquid phase, which goes into the environment pretty quickly, or it goes into, into biosolids. And biosolids or sludge is a hot topic now in Maine, especially because of PFAS. The stuff that's treated from your house is actually really rich fertilizer, assuming it's clean. The issue is we're not getting clean fertilizer. But the biosolids are either sent to a landfill, they're incinerated, or they're sent to land applications, so like agricultural areas. 25% of the PVA breaks down in wastewater treatment plants. 75% exists in the environment and goes through into wherever it goes through. Now, this, is a, this was a challenge for me because I would give these talks and people would kind of attack me and say, I thought I was buying this stuff for the environment. It was good. And I said, You're not, it's not your fault. They're, they're marketing it really poorly. And they're making it seem like it's biodegradable when it's really not. And we actually had an audience with the EPA. And I asked them, I said, you know, your, your labeling is making people lie and say it's plastic free. Well, we don't have anything to do with that. And I said, OK. 
And I said, I said, okay, would you change this designation from a green circle to be more accurate? No, we don't really do that. Just the other day, we did that for a perfluoral alkyl substance. And I was like, you just did that for a PFAS chemical the other day? We've known 30 years is bad. So this for me was really shocking because a lot of this greenwashing is still going on where they're saying it's biodegradable. Technically it is. Technically everything in this room is biodegradable if it's over millions of years, sure. So the term is very loose and what, what basically has to happen for that to be true is that material has to be subjected to the right microorganisms and the right pH and the right temperature for the right amount of time and it can't change. And, and you know, we, we we woke up the beast that's called the American Cleaning Institute, multi-billion dollar organization. One thing I'd like to point out, this paper was published by two grad students. I did, our advisor took himself off because he was too busy. He's not here. <laughs> it's unheard of to have two grad students publish this, but we did it because we were angry. Um, so we woke up this industry that's now attacking these two grad students. 3,000 employees, multi-billion dollar. They actually wrote a letter, they wrote an official comment to the journal where we published our paper saying that we should withdraw it because it was wrong. We had to write a response, and after that, it was crickets. We didn't hear anything about it. <laughs> but in the meantime, they kept coming out with these blogs that were ignoring all this evidence of film biodegradability, uh, all this stuff, misinformation, all that. Their, their kind of shining study shows that in, their, in, in perfect conditions, this stuff will, I think 60% of it will degrade in 28 days. Water sits in a wastewater treatment plant for 18 hours, maybe up to two days. From there, it would need completely stable ecosystem environmental conditions to degrade. Where on the planet does that happen? So this kept happening. And the funny thing is our research agrees with each other. We're just like, hey, that's, you're not talking about a real world scenario. But the, the best thing about this is I now work at the Shaw Institute, which is a small nonprofit. And the more they were angry, the more we got featured in the news, which is great. <laughs> so people started to kind of question it. Is this a thing? And we even got a Washington Post article and, and I have a marketing friend who said, if you get your name featured in the Washington Post, that's like seven or $800,000 worth of marketing because of the readership. <laughs> keep, keep poking. And this was in November of 2022. January 9th of 2024, we get another one. Now this is about sheets. They're kind of covering it from, let's see what this person says. Let's see what they say. With, for us, it's like science says this, like you can take whatever angle you want to take. Um, and now the most recent one, the city of New York is considering banning these uh, because of this. Now, the ACI heard about this. This was introduced by a city councilman in New York City, and they immediately tried to get an, an audience with them and explain their point of view and all that. So this is taking a little while, plot politics drag. But this is really good because there's, there's states and cities around the US saying, we can't allow plastic to go down the drain. Is this plastic? That might be an issue. Or they, they have an issue with labeling. You can't say it's biodegradable if it's not, or eco-friendly, or vegan, or whatever crap they were talking about. So this is starting to catch on around the US. And again, people, my, my dad bought these pods, our coworker bought these pods because they're marketed a certain way. So I, I always want people to not feel bad when this happens because you're kind of duped into thinking it. And it is kind of out of sight, out of mind. If something dissolves, you usually think that it's okay. So then we got the question, are plastics harmful to people? <clears throat> it's a big thing to study. Yeah, sheets are also made out of the same stuff. Charlie, what should we clean our clothes with? <laughs> <laughs> so this is, see, okay, so these are really good questions. You know that whole adage, like for every action, there's an opposite reaction, right? So consider the people that come to you and say, I only eat vegetables, I don't eat meat. There's going to be a different reaction, right? Something to do with higher consumption of soy and the rainforest and the farming need. There's going to be a response. Like we can't really beat the system. If someone says use, use glass, glass is heavier. It's going to be worse to transport. It's going to have a worse footprint. It's going to use more water to clean. And it's going to make whatever you're buying more expensive because they can transport less of it and their fuel costs go up. The fuel costs go up. So it's always there's, my, my point that I try to say to people is always take like an external thought process for this. Like think about it from the other side. Why is it used and what might the impact be of the alternative? People say to me, well, Charlie, I use the pods because it's better than the, than the plastic bottle, that I, the, the jug. It, it sucks. It's like saying, do you want me to kick you or punch you? Like they're, they're both going to 
not be great. But I'll tell you that the life, the life cycle of that jug is it has a 10 to 12% chance of getting recycled. And if it doesn't, it goes to a landfill. And, and the time it'll take to turn that bottle into microplastics, we're talking decades and decades and decades. Those sheets and pods become pollution, boom, as soon as you use it. The other aspect of this is that I never want to be, Danny and I both know people that will have these great solutions for things in their mansion in Malibu. It's like, yes, <laughs> sure. You can fill it up there with this expensive stuff, but I never like to, to say things that middle or lower income families can't also adopt because a lot of sustainability initiatives are, are inaccessible. And that's, that's really too bad. Um, so, so what I would say is the jug, the jug, in my opinion, is better. I'm not a laundry expert. I just know the material. I think the cardboard boxes are multi-layer films. I don't know. But if the concern is it ending up in the environment, it's going to end up faster as a pot or a sheet than as a jug or in, in a cardboard box. In a perfect world, it could be glass. But again, take that outside perspective. Let's think about glass. And is it accessible? Sometimes it's hard for me if I'm buying something of something that I know other people can't afford. And as a grad student, I would go to all these talks and people would tell me, yeah, you should just do this. And I'd be like, you know how much money I make? <laughs> I can't do any of that. <laughs> so I think we're trending towards, I think a recent thing has been pellets. So some companies make a, a concentrated pellet that, that you have inside of a package that's paper. And you can put that right into the laundry machine and it, does, and it doesn't have plastic in it. I think that, but I don't know how much it is. I think that that's, you just kind of have to pick and choose. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is that we're trending towards being away from plastic by introducing new materials. So we talked about there's like a corn-based plastic, poly, polylactic acid. <clears throat> it does last a long time because if you want something to be like plastic, plastic lasts a long time. Therefore, if you make something to be like that, it's going to act like that. But it's not fossil fuel based. So, if we have a 10-step process for replacing a plastic in a scenario, we can't let, just because we're at step two, shut it all down. It's going to take incremental progress to get to the point where we can actually replace it. It's very inexpensive. It's, it's cost-friendly for us to get. It's durable. It lasts forever. And it's cheap. We have to try really hard to beat those qualities. Um, it makes you sick, too. It makes you sick, too. Yeah. So, it can make you sick, but it can also, plastic has saved my life through multiple surgeries. And plastic saved lives during COVID. I mean, plastic saved so many lives during COVID. So we have to walk a fine line. S yes, it's true that some plastics are really harmful and toxic. But it's also true that a lot of them are not. They just have a really bad impact on the planet. So I try to just walk both sides of the, of, of the line. Well, I mean, I know we need medical plastic. Absolutely. I'm a nurse. But uh, I still think that, like, like you were asking about laundry detergent, for instance, I think that there are lots of alternatives, and they're not always all expensive. I mean, Good. There are places around here where you can get refillable several different things. Take your own glass jar that's not being transported just except for by you. But anyway. Sure, yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, there are ways of doing it. Again, that outsider thing, like, is, is this adopted? This should be adopted in every city. And then you have, you have the barrier of even conveying that, that information to other communities of people. And then you have, to, you have to put money and resources into how do I connect with this other community, this other culture that might not understand this and might be closer to the poverty line. So we have to make sure that we're taking every approach possible while also understanding, yeah, plastic water bottles suck. But go to Flint and say that. They're going to say, well, I need this or else I can't. So it's like I can't say ban them all. But we, we can say, if you don't need it, don't use it. Just like with the cutlery. That's a terrific idea. I don't need it. Keep it. That's a really good idea. These are all really good talking points. Um, anyways, the, we have to be aware of these things. From a science perspective, I was finding fecal bacteria. I was finding harmful algae in, the, in, in Blue Hill, PFAS chemicals, and plastic. And then we'd study it more. And we'd find it in things that both animals eat, areas that we swim in, we eat. And then we were finding it moving up to animals as well. But not a lot was being done about humans. Um, one of the other kind of ways that the scientific world is lacking right now is they need to push harder at the so what. My advisor used to always say, so what? It's on the beach. What does it do? It's in the animal. What does it do? Because now there's a lot of stuff coming out where it says we found it. And it's like, OK, but 
let's think bigger. What, what's going on here? How is this interacting with the ecosystem? Um, so thankfully, I was contacted by some wonderful uh, pediatric doctors and then PhDs out of NYU that were saying, we're really concerned about this interaction between microplastics and women that are pregnant. And there had been some, some mouse-based models that showed that plastics within the mother could end up in organs of the fetus. Now, whether, that's a model, and we didn't know if this was happening with people. So they were saying, they asked me, can we send you a bunch of human tissue? And, I, and I, they were like, have you worked with it? And I was like, yeah. And I, I mean, kind of. <laughs> I worked on mammal tissue. That's close enough, right? <laughs> So we created a method to be able to do this. And, and generally, what you do as a researcher is you don't want to start at step one. Someone else has done this before. I want to see their methods, and I want to make it better. And that's what you always do. So I started to look through it, all of the researchers suggesting that this could happen in mice. And then I noticed that there had been some studies done on humans. Now, this is a really wonderful way to research things, because generally, placentas are you bury it or you throw it away. But it's a, it's a snapshot of your health that you can get from really no other samples. So it's a really wonderful thing to study. N in a study means the sample size. So remember when I asked it the question about the pineapple and the pizza? Is two? Like two for me is just very, very low. So I notice already this is an opportunity, an opportunity to, to work on this and to make it better. Because it's a very low sample size. Now this paper was considered to be kind of the leading one to follow gold standard. This is our lab in Blue Hill for the time being. Um, these are our hoods that we do a lot of work in. You do work in hoods because if you're working with chemicals, you don't want to breathe it in. And we also talked about the things floating around your house where when you, have, you can shed fibers from your clothing. So as a researcher, if there's a bunch of stuff in the air, you want to control that as much as you can. Because I guarantee you there's been a lot of studies that have been published that found plastic probably came from them somehow. So, so these hoods are really important for controlling it as best you can. That paper, that gold standard paper, said that they did their experiments without the use of a hood. And so if they found plastic fibers, they didn't consider them in the results. I would reject this paper. That's not great. If you're in a lab and you look at your gloves, gloves have a static charge. Fibers are not the only thing you're going to bring around a sample. You can bring all sorts of particles. So this, this was the new level of research, right? Very low. So we had a chance to improve upon that. This working group of women that donate their placentas, there's 3,000 of them that do this. NYU collects their entire life history, which is brilliant. This is like the why, the how. How, how can we study this better? But I took a step back. Because as, as the nurse would know, what are hospitals filled with? Right. How do we know it didn't come from the delivery? It's hard to say. So. What I did is I said, send me every single plastic item involved in a birth, C-section or birth. And they did, 175 different things. And I have an instrument that when I showed you the little girl working on, where I could analyze every single one to get an idea as to if they're, con if they're contaminating their samples. As, as you know, it's not just one plastic thing. There's all these little parts to it, different colors. You've got to break it all apart. So we submitted this for a conference. Because this was us saying, instead of starting the analysis, we're going to start to do better. This is the new standard. And the conference had a lot of my peers there. <laughs> so it was a little, a little tense. But I presented this in, at a conference in Ireland. Uh, I showed our, our sort of placenta analysis that we were doing. Uh, essentially, what you do is you digest it, you filter it, and then you analyze the filter using this really nice instrument at Colby College. We even went as far as to design this thing that could encapsulate the filter so it's not exposed to ambient air. No matter where you move it, there's no contamination happening. And I got to talk about the kind of layout and breakdown of all the plastics involved in a birth. And it was a really successful, like I can't believe they gave me a platform talk. It was very nice for, for some. Uh, but this is a tough process. This takes three days. I have to cut it up. I can, I, I can only run six samples at a time. It's just humans are icky. I never wanted to work with humans. <laughs> they are. I prefer killer whale poop, honestly. <laughs> so we wanted to make this new standard better. And I think we started to, which is great. So then we came back to NYU. We started to do some digesting. And we could also look at all of these other factors to see if that makes someone more at risk. There is a lot of data that they collect, which is really critical. Socioeconomic position there, diet, smoking, vaping. Do you have some sort of medical implant device? Do you wear a mouth guard at night? 
all sources of plastic that this, this is the standard for how research should be. Not just I'm finding it here. We got to do better. So this was really a, a big deal for us to take on for that reason. I was very happy about that. I didn't want to talk about this because at my work there's two full-time people. One of them is me. And there's only one person that goes in the lab, and that's me, for this stuff. Um, so I didn't advertise this. I can only do so many samples at once. Harvard gets wind of this and says, I'm a gastroenterologist. I work with people that have Crohn's disease, that have ulcerative colitis, diverticulitis, and cancer. If, if there's something foreign in the body, it might inhibit the body's ability to fight the disease. Can I send you samples? Yes, of course, yep. So I'm working with a gastroenterologist there who's an MD, and that was exactly his thinking. It's not that microplastics cause the disease, but they inhibit our ability to fight the disease, maybe. This is a big deal. This is the what, so what? This is a big so what, really big one. And then ASU hears about this and says, we're concerned that particles are passing the blood-brain barrier. And we study things like dementia and Alzheimer's. Can we send you samples? This just happened like three days ago. Yes, of course. Now, now this, it's, it's sort of the same process. You, your body goes, so, goes, goes through so much to battle these diseases that if you insert something else in there that shouldn't be in there, it's going to alter the trajectory of the disease and, and absolutely for the worst. Completely different situation. This is sort of like uh, bowel resections. Again, it's, it's, it's something that surgically happens where something's removed, but the person is still alive. This one, unfortunately, is not. Um, this institute where I used to work has access to the best blood and tissue bank in the United States. So unfortunately, if someone in Arizona passes away, within two hours, if they're donors, everything gets, gets uh, isolated. So now they want to send us samples. And, and again, we're very small. <laughs> this is a lot of work, and I can only run six samples at a time. And when I look at those three studies, and I think, OK, well, let's, let's look at five years from now. How many samples is that? It's like 2,200 like, samples coming my way. I can run six at a time. Um, our operating budget's not very big. When I got there, it had been around for 30 years. When I got there, we gave the institute its first budget. So it needed some help, 30 years and one budget. Um, but I could clearly see how much money we had. And I, couldn't, I didn't want to spend a lot more. So what do I do? I buy an instrument that is 60% of our budget, right there. <laughs> this is the most cutting instrument, cutting edge instrument for plastic analysis, especially in tissue. It's called a pyrolysis GCMS. It essentially evaporates a sample and it leaves behind chemical signatures of the plastics because they can withstand the heat, unlike all the biologic material that gets burned off. It is the future of, of the research industry. It also greatly reduces contamination because I'm not having to sit and wait and digest. It goes right into the instrument, and the instrument gives me amazing data. So we bought this, and it was very expensive. And then I started to kind of, like, all right, the instrument's this big. And I went in our lab, and I was like, We have a problem. So in the spirit of not spending any more money, we're going to try to buy a new building. <laughs> this is in Blue Hill. It's for sale. And it's very unique in that they're, the people who own the building have a CBD store right here. And then to test the CBD, they had a lab built here. There's also a random like karate studio here. There's a bedroom. There's no a kitchen here and bedrooms here. The most random building ever, but perfect for us. So we kind of put our, our hats in the ring for that, and we're, we're negotiating it. Uh, we haven't had a, this is being recorded. Uh, uh, good, I remember that. So <laughs> this is what we're working on right now. We took that idea of saving money and kind of just, it went out the window. But this is the future of not only our research institute, but science as it relates to plastics. This is absolutely looking at the impact and how it affects human health. And, and this is really, you know, we feel really strongly about that. The other thing about our current space is that it's in downtown Blue Hill. If anyone's been to Blue Hill, it's a great little town. But we're in downtown Blue Hill, and we're in the lab. A lot of foot traffic. So what's the point of being there? So to spend even more money, we're turning our current location into an educational, environmental education center to be more interactive with the community. So it's, we're kind of building on the past, and the present for us is analyzing it, and the future is teaching the next generations about everything here. So we're working with a designer to make something that's kind of along these lines. And we just fundraised for a touch tank. We have a touch tank now. Uh, we're all, we, we have a part-time staff of three, so there's like five of us doing all this stuff. So I'm very happy. My wife here, she's here, who's 
our education outreach specialist. Um, she's got her hands full, but, but this is the kind of craziness that is our lives these days. The instrument's in Blue Hill. We're working on getting the space, and we're also working on opening this up this summer. So it is very exciting. Now, here is what I kind of like to, to end on. We, we have to kind of think more, when we look at plastic, why is it used in this, in this area, in this circumstance? What about it is beneficial in this moment? Styrofoam probably is my least favorite type of plastic because we could easily replace that with something else. And the purpose it serves is to just like not break things or keep docks up. That's a pretty low level thing. If we're talking about syringes and IV bags, then it's a little bit of a higher level thing. Contact lenses, there's certain things that should be replaced and some things that's just, it's going to be that until it's not. But this for me, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the oil industry to listen to us. And I'm, tr I'm, I'm starting that by trying to get rid of stuff that they can just brush us off with because they're saying, no, the fish, yeah, one has it, but the million don't, done. This here is a challenge for me. We, we, and this is my opinion, take it or leave it. This sign's made out of plastic. The vests are made out of plastic. The shoes, the hat, the glasses. So if I work in the oil industry, I'm gonna be like, you guys are hypocrites. You're wearing all this stuff and holding the sign up, but you, you, who's leaving in a car today? Who's, who's taking buses? Who's sitting on a plastic bicycle seat? It's, it's like we can't, if we say something this, like ban plastic, no, they're just gonna, they're not gonna listen. It's, it's, it's a big challenge. And then the other thing is, I fully support everyone's right to, to petition protests. It's a, a, a fundamental thing in America. When you write on plastic, you can't write on cardboard, you can't recycle anymore. So <laughs> there's just little things that if I'm sitting, and I got to work with the people that are against what we believe because they like plastic and they make money from it. So it's like, this is so easy for them to say no. That, that's not worth taking seriously. And I want to give you another scenario. Imagine you're a grad student and you get a call from a, an investor that wants to give a lot of money to new innovation. And the investor says, while extracting oil from the ground, the pipes can weather over time to the point that they crack. When they crack, oil leaks out and goes into the environment. And they say, I want to hire your lab to design a barrier that goes around them to prevent that from happening. We'll give you a bunch of money to do it. You have the opportunity to say, I don't believe in taking oil from the, gr from the ground, so I'm not going to work with you. Or you, you have the opportunity to say, yes, let's design that technology to, to prevent more contamination from happening. The other part of that is it's Exxon on the phone. What do you do? And this, this happened in the lab I worked in. There was another study having to do with whales. Have you heard about Navy sonar beaching whales it being a source? Mm -hmm. yeah. Was a part of that back in the day. The Navy paid for it. These groups have a lot of money. So if we can get everyone around the table, material scientists, plastic industry, Amazon, Coca-Cola, plastics researchers, biologists, whatever, educators, and we can all have this collective conversation where, where we say, all right, Coca-Cola, what do you need from your material? And they say, it has to withstand this much stress and be transported here. OK, and then you go, material science people, do you have something you can use that's not plastic to replicate that? And they say, well, we think seaweed might be a thing. And they say, OK, Coke and Amazon, give them money. They'll research it. It's a really efficient process. I, if there's one thing you take away from this, vilification and shame don't go far. We, we have to have a collective conversation where we use empathy to see things from their perspective as we want them to see from ours. Why do we care about this? Why are we passionate about it? Well, what do they need? And then if we can get everyone there and, and they could pay for it, it's a really efficient system. I'd like to bring up an example of what's really frustrating about this. As I said, that 10-step process for replacing it. Sun Chips made a fully compostable, fully compostable lab or bag. And I know about this because um, there was ads run in the Super Bowl. This was a big deal. Sun Chips heard, we hate that your, your bags are plastic. We hate it. Ends up in the environment, sucks as trash, whatever. So they started investing money in making a compostable bag. Again, they, and they paid for advertising during the Super Bowl. If you know anything about the ads, it cost them a lot of money. I know more about this because the lab that tested this is main base. So I got to talk to the researcher that did it. This hit the shelves, people found it to be too loud, and it was canceled. 
When they opened the bag, it was too loud. So when you think about this from the industry producing plastic, I would absolutely say, you're done. I'm not helping you guys anymore. You nitpick, it's not perfect, so you, you get rid of it. They invested so much money in this. So I, I'm starting to look from the other perspective now because I need to understand why there's a disconnect. And I really feel strongly that our messaging and our, and our thought process and viewpoints need to, need to give a little bit. Let's, let's put ourselves in their shoes. This for me was a really frustrating example to learn about, but now it's like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. But for whatever reason, this movement led to them pursuing something more eco-friendly. And that is a win, and that's something we have to follow. That same <coughs> metric. I think Coca-Cola now is making bottles without a label, which is like, we can't say, no, it's still plastic. You suck. I'm not going to. It's like, no, we, we have to take steps. No label, replace the material. Like, we, we'll get there incrementally, but we just have to, we have to be a little bit more patient and then not be so, so vilifying and so shameful. I really just don't feel those are good strategies for, for any of us. The lab that I used to work in, as I said, their thing was, we need plastics, we don't need waste. That's what they said. I don't fully agree with it, but I understand it. My com this computer right now is not heating up and on fire because of plastic. We talked about the medical industry. Packaging and food reduces greenhouse gases by an exorbitant amount because it helps preserve things. It also makes food cheaper and more accessible. And this is a tough one because people say, well, you know, this and that, and then they eat, you know, avocados from Mexico in winter. And it's like, how did that get there? You know, a lot of times it's things like this. Why is this cheap and fuel efficient? Because some of the parts are plastic. So it's really hard for me to say, ban it, it's the worst. It's a failed material. It's not. But we don't need waste. We produce way too much of it. And a lot of it is harmful as a pollutant and, and actively. So I acknowledge both sides. I get that we need some of it. But a lot of it should be gotten rid of. A lot of the single-use stuff, styrofoam, a lot of that stuff should be replaced. And I am excited. There's a lot of stuff that says by 2050 there'll be this. I like to do the opposite. If we make some good changes, what will we see by 2050? So I like to sort of end on things that I'm excited about. But a lot of times people come up to me and say, Charlie, what's one thing that I can do? If a sentence starts, if you just, it's not going to, no. It's never going to be that simple. We can take small steps that really do add up, and that's a wonderful approach. But we have to acknowledge that it's very complicated. It took us decades to get to the place that we're in. We're not going to get out of it by just something. It's, it's, it's complicated. When someone says, we have a plastic bag ban, I've never, been, I've never seen so many reusable bags in my life. And the footprint of a reusable bag is pretty big. You have to use it 20,000 times to offset how much energy it took. So there's always going to be a reaction. And it's just because it's complicated. We're, we're drowning in this stuff, so we're finally starting to kind of work our way out. And we have to give ourselves a little bit. Forgive yourself. It's OK. It's everywhere. It's not great. I hate that aspect of it. But we also have to be pretty practical of the situation that we're in. We're very dependent on this stuff. But I am very excited about three things in particular. The first is this concept of above ground mining. I love that idea. It's here. Use it again and again and again. Some of the plastic recycling can be toxic, but the stuff that, but when I did this, it wasn't. Because I know what the material is, and I work with scientists that are way smarter than me, so that was a good thing. But if you can reuse the material, if I could have this set up at every hospital, that would prevent so much more plastic waste because they're recovering what they're using. And so much of the stuff is not a biohazard. You can recover it, and you can repurpose it. There's even some groups that collect plastic pollution now, microplastic from the ocean, and they make it into like park benches. It's not great, but it's something. It's better than using new plastic. Um, so I like this idea of kind of above ground mining. This other thing that's really taking off in Maine is green materials. Scientists will look at the complete chemical structure of something like polyurethane, and they'll say, this bond right here is so strong because of the fossil fuel that it came from. Are there bonds like this that exist in nature? And a lot of them found them. So seaweed has bonds that can be used as a true bi bioplastic. And the only reason why I know this because I've seen it. There are a lot of bioplastics that are given a bad name because they do greenwash and they say things that are untrue. But a lot of this now is being done. There's a, there's a farm in Maine using seaweed and algae to replace the pods. And one of my friends is working on it with, with the woman who owns the farm. It's really cool and it's very promising technology. But we have to understand that if we make something to, to mimic a material that lasts a long time, it's going to last a long time. 
it will get to the point where it doesn't, but then you're compromising the structure for, for, for the sustainability aspects of it. They made this, I can't stop talking about this, they made this plastic out of biological materials that would photodegrade. So it was only used in really dark areas with no sunlight, like in this room. And if it ended up in sunlight, it would completely break down within days into sustainable, no plastic, good for the ecosystem type things. It's hard to beat plastic the price, the, the durability, all those things. So it's going to take a little time to get there. But so much of this is being done that I'm very excited about the road ahead. I think we're going to get there sooner than later. You're going to, it's going to be replaced before we even realize it. I think that's what's going to happen. The other thing that's really cool, again, Adidas. Adidas is a big company that uses a lot of plastic. If you'll notice about this shoe, same color here. Base, outside, lace. Same material here. You can take that shoe, grind it up, and make a new one. Because it's, they listened. All the same material, all the same color. So it's made out of polyurethane, same thing as the seats that you're sitting on in a lot of your mattresses. But you can recycle it, truly recycle it, again and again and again to the point that it gets tested and then you throw it away. It's not great because we're still using plastic, but that's me being realistic of the situation we're in right now. Because if I go to Adidas and say stop using plastic, they're just going to be like, no, it's not going to happen. But if I can say, hey, these material scientists think if you make it this way, you can at least recover it and reuse it again and again, that's more practical. It's just a step in the right direction. We're not going to make the huge bound right away. It's going to take time. So these things I'm very happy about. Um, Sorry if that was a lot. Happy early Earth Day. <laughs> we work right here, I think. Yeah, we work right around here. That's Blue Hill. Nowadays, it's almost looking like this again. Now it's a little sadder in the winter, but it's OK. Uh, so uh, yeah. Can you comment on the new end material uh, silicone? It seems to be replacing a lot of plastic parts. It's I think it's technically plastic as well, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. So again, it, it might be, I don't know as much about that specifically, but it, it's, it's sort of that situation where you're trying to pick the lesser of the two. Which one might be better to, to, to use, which one might have fewer emissions and less of an impact or a less end of life, or better end of life strategy. But I don't know as much about that, about silicone. But yeah, it is plastic, yeah. I was reading on the earthday.org site about a lot of different stats now, and the most concerning to me was of all the ages of humans now, the most contamination is going into babies. Yep. And I never thought about it. Baby bottles, yep. diapers, their surround clothes, everything is giving off those plastics. Is someone kind of starting to watch how that happens as they get older and, and do some studies on that and see if there's a connect with that and whatever yeah. viable chronic disease comes back? I took that slide out because I didn't want to talk too long. but. That was one of the, the further the follow-up studies that we would do with, with NYU is to then look at once the baby's born, what's the exposure like. Everything that, that they are surrounded by is pretty much plastic. It's not toxic plastic. So they could eat it and um, they'll swallow microplastics. But if I give someone a cup of microplastics that they're chewing, it's just going to come out. Most of it's going to come out. It has to be really, really small, small, small for it to get sequestered in our body. But those are complicated things, right? Because not only do I have to make the material with that communal table, now I need physicians there. Because I need them to say, all right, but now you have to do experiments with kids or with people to see that it's actually not harming them. The reason why we make PFAS chemicals, we make chemicals, and we don't, like you might think to yourself, why is it that they didn't know this was going to be bad? That's, that's a tough, expensive road to go down. Whereas a lot of companies are like, all right, no, the chemical works. It's flexible. Uh, it's, it's got flame retardant properties. It's good. Go, go, go. But to take the steps of making the material and then getting doctors to sit down and agree to do a study to see if it has any adverse health effects, it's a big deal. But, but yeah, that's, that's, for me, that's, it's shocking, but it's like, yeah, babies are just everywhere. Yeah. And I think that was created with intent again because it's like you, want, you don't want babies to be exposed to things over and over and over again. It's like contact lenses. We did a study with them. And now they're phasing out the long-term ones for the single-use lenses because there's a lower chance of getting infection. So there's a purpose for why it's there. It's, and it's, it's difficult to replace it. But I, but I share your concern. That's a pretty scary thing, especially as people are developing. Yes.